We're going to continue from the session that we had this morning, and we have some just to continue to look at the uh, two other case studies and then looking at the cross cutting lessons learned. So we have three more presentations, and then there is the QA session. And can I say um, thank you very much for those that have been asking questions through Slido because I can see there are numerous questions already accruing. And if you do have the opportunity to continue asking or vote on the questions that you feel are, are going to percolate to the top to be asking the Q&A session. So the next, um, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to invite um, Professor Kuno Fang from the um, Jamen University and uh, Dr. Gonzalo Conero from Nero Sweden who are going to be discussing uh, hierarchical planning and also um, looking at it from the context of the experience of the MFZ in China. Okay. Yeah, okay. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a, a great experience to uh, be with the international team on start, studying the uh, MSP cross-border, and that gave me the the opportunity to uh, share China's experience on marine function zoning. I'm uh, I'm uh, from uh, Tsinghua from from Xiamen University. Uh, in uh, this talk, I will talk about the hierarchical uh, marine function zoning to address crop border issue. You have heard about marine function zoning system in China, and there are lots of uh, interesting aspects of marine function zoning, including uh, that uh, important uh, for the sea use management in China. But today, uh, my talk will just focus on the, uh, uh, how marine function zoning addressing the cross-border issues. I will take uh, Xiamen as an example. Uh, Xiamen is uh, located in uh, Fujian province. Uh, one of the top 10 uh, port uh, in China and also a very, very famous uh, tourism attraction uh, in this region. And in China, there is uh, traditional uh, marine activity like uh, marine aquaculture and fisheries and also some new uh, marine activities like uh, recreational activities. So, uh, and we had witnessed the very fast growth of economy. So you can imagine the sea must be very busy. And uh, at the same time, we also have the endangered species uh, in the shaman waters. And so that is a challenge to, to balance the conservation and the development. And in terms of the cross-border issues, uh, I, I would just mention a few, a few here. Uh, one is the pollution. We see pollution from the upstream uh, cities in the watershed and also the neighbor cities, including the marine litters. And secondly is the, it's the a competing demand on the, on the sea areas uh, on the land reclamation and also the port development. So I will t come back here. And also, uh, in, in Xiamen, we have the marine protected areas. It's a national level. And uh, the, the mammals protected in, in, in Xiamen waters, they may get harm uh, when they swim to uh, other neighbor cities. So that's also another challenge. So we have heard a lot about uh, area based management this morning. And uh, area based management uh, has also been highlighted. Uh, been regarded as a key principle in China in its uh, we call the ecological uh, civilization policies, and that had been uh, recognized by UNEP uh, in the report last year. And uh, the the key idea is to trying to to realize the spatial balance uh, by the by the use control and uh, marine function zone is one of the key methods or key tools. Uh, of the uh, area-based management. And you, you have heard uh, yesterday afternoon uh, of one of my colleagues from SOA mention about the uh, section of the marine function zone in China. We, we, we have three uh, different levels from the national to provincial and to city or county level. So in the So in the, uh, 
in the uh, uh, national level marine function zoning, so you, you, you can see uh, we, we divide it to, to different two grades of the CU. So the only grade one has been uh, uh, detonated uh, in, in the national level marine function zoning. And uh, the, the whole uh, sea areas under jurisdiction was divided to uh, five seas and uh, 29 key sea areas. And there are only uh, a general uh, guiding policies uh, or requirements uh, in, in this uh, national level. And as, uh, Fujian, as uh, uh, you can see from the uh, screen, uh, it's, uh, it's in the, located in the southeast of China. Uh, and Fujian province was divided to three parts, in, including middle, uh, uh, east, middle, and the south, and the Xiamen is in uh, the south part. So uh, you can see uh, the, the uh, okay, uh, the main, the main uh, functions uh, of the, uh, this part has been uh, determined as the port and fishing, tourism, and uh, recreation, etc. And then come to the provincial level. So you see that uh, there, there are still great one, but uh, there are more detailed information be provided in the provincial level marine function zoning, like uh, the boundary. The, the, the boundary will be clear, and, and also the size of the sea areas and the uh, coastline land, and and uh, use regulation and the use type and other uh, 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 coastline management or environmental protection. Uh, requirements will be uh, also provided in this provincial level uh, marine function zoning. And then it comes to the city level. And this level uh, marine function zoning plan can be as the basis for uh, the sea use application and uh, approval. So here the, the more, uh, the grade two of the sea use type has been regulated or that uh, designated in the in the every uh, three areas, so uh, there are more um, details of the policies or regulations uh, regarding uh, the, those three areas will be uh, determined. So that is a uh, that is a key uh, a principle of the hierarchy hierarchical uh, system of the marine function zone in China is that the, the lower level uh, marine function zone plan should be consistent with the higher level uh, marine function zone plan. So that guarantee uh, the, the, the conflict between the different province or different uh, cities in, in this case. And if we go further to the developing of the marine function zoning, we found that uh, we have the team. Uh, first, we, we have the leaders group. The leaders group is uh, uh, formed by uh, like city leaders, city mayors, and also the uh, directors of the different departments. And then uh, they, uh, the, the group leaders uh, ensure the, uh, they, they, they address the they, they, are, they are responsible for the coordinating uh, among different sectors or, uh, uh, to, or, or uh, those uh, issues cross, op, cross borders to uh, make, make sure uh, uh, the cross border issues will be addressed. And, and then we have the experts group and also the technician group. So we, for technician group, they, they have, uh, when, when they develop the, uh, a marine function zoning plan, they conduct many uh, related subject study to, um, to uh, collect the data to address the, uh, to, to identify the main pri the priorities and to, uh, to uh, study on the, like, uh, they use demand, the current uh, uh, status, and uh, also like uh, the current uh, status and the fishery environmental protection and land reclamation sector. And 
we have then after we have the draft of the marine function zoning plan, uh, that will be delivered to different sector, different stakeholders for consultation. And that process also guarantees the, uh, uh, the, all the uh, issues related to different stakeholders will be addressed. And this is a, an example of uh, as how the science uh, in this in this morning, uh, in the previous section, the uh, mentioned very often is about the best available science. And the, in, in our case, we also see how the science can inform decision making during the developing the marine function zoning. So this is an example how uh, when we develop the uh, provincial uh, level marine function zoning in Fujian province, so we can see on the, on the, on the right, top, uh, there are many demanding uh, uh, on the marine space, uh, on, on the uh, land reclamation. And then, and, how, and that, that it was uh, uh, between the different uh, two cities, one is the uh, Shaman city, the other one is the Chenzhou city, and how to address this conflict. And then we have, uh, a scientific uh, project is on the, to do the environmental, a strategic environmental assessment to look at how the uh, cumulative impact of all these uh, three areas demand together. And then we look at, uh, we use the multiple disciplinary approach like uh, the water dynamic models, the environmental capacity, and also we look at the ecological effects and also marine resources study and cost benefit analysis to try to do, uh, use those uh, multi dimension uh, analysis, trying to determine which plot of all those uh, uh, CDMA is uh, feasible or not. So then, uh, you can see the results. We and this result and finally be adopted by the f provincial government uh, in, in Fujian. So I, I think uh, uh, that it's a very uh, brief uh, introduction of the uh, case study in Xiamen. And uh, for the the for summarize, I I think there's uh, three three or four. Uh, things I like to highlight. One is the legislation first, and, and that is, uh, the, I think, it's the most important strength for China to implement the marine function zoning plan to make all the marine function zoning plan in China is enforceable. It's not just a, a paper map uh, or paper plan, and. The second is the, uh, what we talk uh, about the uh, hierarchical system of the marine function zoning that ensure the especially the vertical, vertical uh, consistencies which uh, better address the cross-border issues. And the third is uh, best available science we have mentioned uh, that actually pro provide uh, the basis for, for, for the uh, uh, I think the scientific basis to address the cross-border issues. And last but not least, uh, I'd like to mention is the marine spatial planning actually is a, an effective tool of the integrated coastal management, but it's not the only one. So in, in the practice of the ICM in Xiamen, uh, we, we use the marine function zoning but uh, we also have other coordinating mechanisms like the city alliance, uh, city alliance with the neighbor cities like Xiamen Chenzhou uh, or Xiamen Zhangzhou. And that is all, uh, also an important uh, instrument or mechanism that address the cross-border issues. Uh, that's all for uh, my presentation uh, for, for this part. I thank you for your attention. And may I now uh, hand over to my colleague, uh, Conchalo. Uh, thank you, Kinwa. Good afternoon. 
I will share some, some reflections more related to implementation because that's, that's what sort of this hierarchical system uh, enables. It's, it's a feature of the implementation of, of marine functional zoning in China. And, and I would maybe first like to, to sort of very simplistically qualify implementation as sort of the process for the flow of instructions, learning or information, but also influence between the different actors in a, in a planning process. Um, and these act actors are both organizations, but also, and maybe more importantly, individuals, because the individuals work, or the, sorry, the organizations work or exist through, through individuals. And in, in the case studies we've, we've, we've explored, uh, it seems like the, or all of them combine formal uh, uh, um, platforms for, for, this, for these exchanges and informal platforms. And I'll just share some, some thoughts on, on these two types. As for formal uh, structures or platforms for implementation, they are likely to be necessary when you're talking transnational uh, marine planning. And it's often, in all our cases, there have been, they have been necessary to commit organizations across different jurisdictional levels to a common course of action. Uh, organizations and marine users. So it's, it's the, 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 the ability to, to tell organizations, do this, do that. Uh, they're also necessary for committing resources to the plan, telling organization A to commit X amount of, of, of resources to, to the process. And they're also useful for documenting the process because typically, uh, uh, and, and in our cases, that, that, that is, is very clear, uh, it is through these formal processes that the different stages or the different developments in the, in the process are documented. So, so I, would, I would sort of qualify the, 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 these formal processes as a means for committing organizations. The informal processes, on the other hand, can be seen as more useful for committing the individuals or for building sort of a constituency, of, for, for building the capacity and, and the engagement of, of individuals in, involved in the process. They can be useful in the absence of formal, of formal institutions. They can be useful, and they have been in some, in the, the, our, our core triangle example, it's very, very explicit on that. It's been, a, a, and I would say also the Chinese case is, is very much so, that before a, a formal structure was put in place, there, was, there were many years of work through informal platforms, work groups, pilot projects, to, to, to experiment with, with, with marine planning. Um, Informal structures are more agile uh, and they're res less resource demanding than our uh, formal, uh, formal structures. So they can react more, they're more easily uh, convened than, than formal structures. They tend to be more open and inclusive of different stakeholders. So they offer a platform for broadening the scope of, 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 of entities involved in the process. And that we have seen in our cases. And thereby, they're very useful, and, and they have been used uh, uh, to create trust or to establish trust among, among individuals. Uh, even in the presence of formal structures where decisions are made, informal structures are very often, and that we've seen also in our cases, uh, are the platform for the sort of behind the scenes negotiations so for making the decisions that then are approved through the, the formal processes. So, so I mean, the thought that uh, MSP is, is more a political process than a technical one. And they are very often, and they have been used in the cases we've studied, as a platform for learning among the individuals and the organizations involved. Uh, and I, I'd just like to, to close with, a, with a, a, a remark on this sort of formal, informal dimension also as it applies to conformance or to in, in conformance with the plan or enforcement of the plan, where we have seen in, in our case studies the, and, and that I guess will be the case in many transnational MSP processes where enforcement capabilities will always be limited by the sovereign rights of, of, of countries. Uh, hard enforcement will always be difficult. And in, in, in one case study of ours in particular, um, we have seen the, the value of having this more informal peer pressure type of, of, of ensuring compliance through the process. Um, and I'll stop here also because my time is off. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gonzalo and indeed Kinoa for the presentation.
I'm now going to move on to our fourth case study. And so I can invite Laura Whitford from the Nature Conservancy and Hannah Thomas to invite you back from um, UN Environment's World Conservation Monitoring Centre to um, discuss effective monitoring evaluation illustrated through the Coral Triangle Initiative. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Have you had a good lunch? Um, okay, so yeah, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the case study of the Coral Triangle Initiative. Um, and so what I'm gonna do first is give you a sense of where the Coral Triangle is. I can get this thing to work, okay, perfect. Um, okay, so you can see the coral triangle here outlined in red. Um, that red boundary is a scientific delineation of the most significant um, area of marine biodiversity on the planet. Um, and so anywhere within that red boundary um, is the highest coral biodiversity on the planet, at least 500 different hard coral species. Um, and as you can see, that boundary connects six different countries. So Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines, Papua New Guinea, Solomon Islands, and Timor-Leste. And so you can see that even though they share these common resources, um, for anyone who's been to that part of the world or knows that part of the world at all, it's an incredibly diverse corner of the planet. And you know they have something in common, but they're also very diverse politically, economically, socially, and so on. So just to underscore what a remarkable region this is, I'm gonna give you a few statistics about the Coral Triangle. Um, so firstly, there we go. Um, so the total area of reefs is about uh, 75,000 square kilometers. Um, that's about 29% of global reefs um, of coral reefs globally. Um, so as I mentioned before, there's at least 500 different hard coral species within the triangle, as well as around 3,000 different species of fish. Um, it's six countries, as I mentioned, and the combined population of the coral triangle is about 400 million people, so pretty sizable number of people in there. And a rough estimate is that at least 120 million of those relied directly on the marine resources of the Coral Triangle for food security and livelihoods. Um, it's also the spawning ground and nursery for a multi-billion dollar tuna industry in the Western Pacific. And the total value of its mangroves and associated habitats is around $2.3 billion US. So obviously an area which is very significant from an ecological perspective, but also for people. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk you through the Coral Triangle Initiative. So in 2009, in recognition of these incredible resources that they share, um, but also to the significant threats to those resources, and particularly because the threats to those resources tend to be transboundary in nature, and we're talking about things like overfishing and climate change, which you can't deal with effectively one country at a time, the um, leaders of those Coral Triangle countries decided to come together to launch the Coral Triangle Initiative on Coral Reefs, Fisheries and Food Security. They, so the leaders of those six countries came together, so presidents and prime ministers, to launch what's called the Regional Plan of Action. That's a 10-year document um, and it outlines five goals, which you can see there. So seascapes, fisheries management, marine protected areas, climate change adaptation and threatened species. Um, in addition to uh, those goals, the Regional Plan of Action also called for the development of a monitoring and evaluation system to sit across the top of that. Okay, moving on. Um, one note I did just want to quickly make is that, you know, we've talked about marine spatial planning as it relates to quite a broad range of case studies today and yesterday. Um, and what I wanted to say is that, you know, in our view, the CTI CFF really represents a strengthening and an aligning of various marine governance and spatial planning efforts rather than sort of seeking to develop um, a specific marine spatial plan to sit across those countries. So I think that's a really important uh, point to make. Okay. 
Okay, so as I said, the regional plan of action called for the development of an M&E system. Um, so here you can see the Monitoring and Evaluation Systems Operation Manual, which was really the culmination of that effort. Um, that effort was led by the Monitoring and Evaluation Working Group, which was one of the sort of formal organs of the CTI that was set up upon its establishment. Um, the purpose of that M&E system is really to track the progress of the CTI CFF towards goals outlined in the Regional Plan of Action using indicators that are measurable. So those indicators were developed by technical working groups. Um, so in, as I mentioned, there were different formal bodies that were set up within the CTI CFF. And one of those types of bodies was a technical working group. And so there were five of those corresponding to each one of the five goals of the regional plan of action. And they are a really important mechanism for collaboration between the different member countries of the CTI CFF, um, just because within each of those technical working groups, you have representatives from all of the six countries. Um, so the indicators that were developed by those technical working groups referred to um, outputs, outcomes, and also higher level impact. Um, sorry. Um, in terms of benchmarks, I quickly wanted to mention that, you know, in order, um, in addition to selecting the indicators, um, some of the working groups um, actually develop tools to measure those indicators. So, for example, there was an MPA technical working group which developed an MPA management effectiveness system called the Coral Triangle MPA system, or CTMPAS as it's known. Um, and so the purpose of that system was to measure specifically the indicator relating to the percentage or the area of marine protected areas under effective management across the Coral Triangle. Um, obviously, if you're going to sort of measure that indicator, you need to be able to define what effective management means. And so for that reason, they articulated benchmarks to um, be clear about what um, an effectively managed MPA actually looks like. Um, so some of the working groups also developed a roadmap to show that how each country separately would be tracking their indicators. Um, so each country is going to have different actions to meet the targets. And so having a roadmap really allows you to have a, um, to capture the national variation within that broader regional m and system. Um, the m and &E system also describes the process by which data which is collected at the national level then flows up into that regional framework. And finally, um, as I mentioned before, the countries of the Coral Triangle are incredibly diverse and they're also really diverse in terms of capacity. Um, and so one of the things that happened at the beginning of this um, process was to do a capacity assessment just of those countries to monitor and evaluate the status of resources within their um, EZs. So um, again, I think this kind of highlights a challenge uh, within efforts at cross-border um, collaboration, just the idea that you're going to have stakeholders in there which have some variability in terms of their capacity. So there we just have the purpose. This is a busy slide, so I won't talk too much about it, but um, the, I think the busyness really kind of reflects on the complexity of the CTI as a whole. Um, so just to talk you through a little bit of it, if you look at the blue boxes on the left-hand side of the screen, that really talks about work that's going on at the national level within the Coral Triangle countries. So in addition to the regional plan of action that I mentioned before, there are also national plans of action for each of the countries. Um, and those NPOAs, as they're known, are overseen, are overseen by a national coordinating committee. Um, and so that sort of represents the country. It's made up of um, a range of different government agencies within that country, as well as development partners, which um, try and support that NCC with financial inputs and technical inputs. 
Um, so those NCCs report against the progress of the NPOA and they feed that up into what's known as the SOM, the Senior Officials Meeting, so that box at the top. And that SOM happened once a year. Um, but the NCC also reports back on the country's contribution to the regional plan of action. And they do that through those technical working groups that I had mentioned earlier. Um, so the progress against the regional plan of action is really communicated to the SOM by the technical working groups as well as the regional secretariat. Um, they also provide inputs to the State of the Coral Triangle report, which is developed periodically, as well as the CT Atlas, which you can see in that green box there, um, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. Um, as you can see in the long yellow arrow on the side, Another intention of the monitoring and evaluation system is really to form part of an adaptive management strategy um, in which senior officials can make changes to the regional plan of action or the national plans of action in order to enhance their effectiveness. So here you can see that the m and &E system itself really helps to stimulate collaboration across the borders. That's a really important function that it serves. Okay, now I'm just quickly going to step you through a few of the levels within the, the M&E system um, using goal three on MPAs to help illustrate. So across the bottom here, you can see the five goals. So seascapes, climate change adaptation, marine protected areas, ecosystem approach to fisheries management and endangered species. Um, so each of these goals has a target that relates to an output and also to the overall goals. And so that relates to the outcomes. So outputs. An example of an output um, indicator as it relates to the MPA goal is having that CT impasse that I mentioned earlier in place, having that system in place as an output. Next up, we have the outcomes. So one level up. Um, so, this is really looking at the sort of success of the regional plan of action. So for example, that indicator around the percentage or the area of the total marine habitat um, in MPAs or marine managed areas. And that feeds up into higher level outcomes. Um, that's just to show that the um, national level outcomes are intended to inform those regional level outcomes. And that feeds into an overall impact, which is really the intention behind the overall CTI. Now, I'm just going to touch, yeah, the impact of the CTI. Um, I'm just going to touch really briefly on the Coral Triangle Atlas. Um, basically, it's a regional database um, which was established in order to house a lot of this data. It's um, intended to house both spatial and non spatial data, um, although. In truth, the majority of the data in there is spatial in nature. Um, the other sorts of non-spatial data that it can accommodate is things like reports and policies and um, other sorts of documents which sit within that broader CTI framework. Um, it's intended to support inputs to the state of the Coral Triangle report. Um, and overall, the intention of the Coral Triangle Atlas, um, and you can actually see the website at the bottom there if you want to go and visit, um, is that it is intended to improve consistency in the data across the six countries um, and also to reduce bias, as well as contributing to a sense of regional identity and achievement. So now I'll pass over to Hannah, who's going to talk about some of the lessons learned. Thank you, Laura. So again, some reflections and thoughts on um, developing monitoring and evaluation systems across the four case studies that we looked at. Um, essentially, all MSP processes will be, to some extent, developing monitoring and evaluation, but it's particularly important in the cross-border MSP. Essentially, as was said right at the beginning of this conference on day one, if there is a collective it kind of suggests that you're open for business. Um, and, and I think that's a really important point in this, in this aspect here. Together, there has to be collective assessment of progress so that there can be a, a demonstration that 
that a, a collective is open for business. As we have said before, um, monitoring and evaluation enables adaptive management, which in turn supports the ecosystem approach. Across any kind of uh, collaborative MSP, there, it's, it's beneficial to have consistency across jurisdictions. Each, and in the case studies that we, we looked at, all of the countries or each of the, the members within the processes were all doing things in slightly different ways. So a monitoring and evaluation system really helps to standardize and to, to enhance consistency across those jurisdictions, which is really important if you're going to measure progress, collective progress towards your goals. But actually what you're doing then is demonstrating that together you can really attract investment. If you can demonstrate progress, that's when the money can start to flow in. But as Laura really highlighted, the CTI shows you that th this isn't just a tick box exercise in order to be able to assess progress. The development of an m and &E system can really support cooperative working. So there were numerous opportunities for CTI countries to get together to thrash out what was really needed for an m and &E system, what the indicators needed to be. And that in itself is a mechanism to build trust, to build good working relationships between entities. So some of the key lessons that we've learned, really the most important one is that it, it worked best when the data were simple and were easily available. There are always limitations to data accessibility. There are always sensitivities around uh, sharing of data. So some of the really strong messages coming through from the case studies were just keep it as simple as you possibly can. Use publicly available data because they are already there and nobody will have or should have a problem in sharing those data. And following straight on from that, the more complex the indicators are, the harder it is to get collective understanding around what they mean and how to use them and how to use them to assess progress. So in the case of the CTI, they had five goals. One of those goals, the MPA goals, was readily understood by all members and indicators were easily agreed upon. But for example, the other goal, the ecosystem approach to fisheries goal, was less well understood and therefore indicators were difficult to agree and were more complex. And the whole discussion really slowed progress on that particular goal. But really this this has a broader impact too. MSP uh, has a lot of data needs. It's a data hungry process, but, but, but we can overblow how technical it is. It's as much about politics and people as it is about the technical aspect. And so the simpler you keep the goals, the more political agreement and willingness you will, you will deliver. Um, so that really, again, re-emphasizes the simplicity message. The Rhode Island case really suggested that it's very possible to deliver a, an extremely comprehensive m and &E system that's very robust, but actually is overly demanding, too ambitious for what the plan actually needed because it raised expectations that actually through, through the process couldn't be delivered, not least because of the resources that, that it would take to actually implement the m and &E system. So again, keep it simple. The data that are gathered within the m and &E system, they, they don't need to just be relevant to the evaluators. They need to be relevant to the managers, but also to the stakeholders themselves. If we need support from the stakeholders, we need buy-in from the stakeholders, they need to be able to identify their information in those indicators. The data that are collected in ME &E systems need to be maintained in the long term. So the Coral Triangle Atlas is an excellent example, but who hosts that data is really important. Do they have the resources to maintain that in the long term? ME &E systems, I've mentioned that they can really ensure consistency, but the CTI demonstrates they can also develop flexibility. The six CTI countries were really keen that they preserved their autonomy so that the indicators meant that there was a benchmark that they all had to meet, but actually each of the six countries could deliver, deliver their results in their own way, which really enhanced their independence. And as I mentioned before, the whole process was used to develop a sense of regional identity 
and such that now the CTI consider themselves to be members of a family. So m and &E can in fact be an enjoyable process. And with that, I'll finish. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laura and Hannah. So that's um, the conclusion of the case studies presentations, and I appreciate that there's been a lot of information to impart. And um, in the, actually, one of the, one of the take-homes from um, uh, this morning's session that was when we were discussing it over lunch was to highlight that even this is just a real small window of the uh, extensive data that were gathered on each of these case studies, which will be shared as deliverables as part of this project in the next couple of months if people want to drill down and understand more of the work. So we're now going to conclude uh, the final presentation is from Stephen Olson, who is going to attempt to draw together the threads and discuss good practices. Now, while Stephen is getting himself ready, could I also invite the speakers from the first session just to join the stage in anticipation of the Q&A after um, Stephen's uh, talk? Just I thought I'd just uh, bring those people on. I'm sure they're going to um, range on the seats there. But uh, if they're coming around behind, then please do. Uh, floor's yours, Stephen. Well, I hope everybody's feeling lively and uh, have had sufficient quantities of coffee to keep awake. And inspired by uh, all that we're talking about, um, when it gets to good practices, which is my topic, you really need to go up a layer from much of what you have been hearing about and draw upon not just the experience of these four case studies, but more broadly, what others have concluded um, are good practices or principles um, for marine spatial planning with an emphasis on uh, cross-boundary collaboration. Um, I must be clear that this is the final steps or one of the final steps in this study and what I am presenting is very much of a, a work in progress. Um, these ideas are going to be refined, maybe changed um, as we go forward. Um, first to a overarching conclusion, which I thought when I first wrote it down would um, cause some people uh, upset. Um, but after listening to yesterday as well as today, I think it's, it's rather obvious that the practice of MSC, MSP, is as much, often more, a social and political process that has major economic implications as it is a scientific and technical challenge. I think this is important because being as old as I am, I remember the early days of ICM where at the beginning, the feeling was it's all about gathering information. It's about more research. It's about more science. And then slowly it evolved that the science only occasionally drives that it really is a social and political process. The same thing holds for MSP. Um, but if one defines what we're all trying to do in these terms, there are some consequences. Um, and one of them is that I've heard several times in this meeting, and certainly our four case studies suggest, that the limiting factor is capacity to do this kind of work um, at many layers, the local, the regional, the national, and certainly the international. Um, secondly, um, the, 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 the figures that we have on the chessboard with which we work have grown out of almost entirely sectoral uh, focuses and switching to a more comprehensive cross-sectoral or trans-sectoral, if one wants to get fancy, uh, is very difficult. It, it does not come easily. And few universities 
it's my sense, have come to the challenge to really educate people in this way of thinking. As Hannah and others have said, really the ecosystem approach is a philosophy. It's a way of seeing the world. It's by no means a paint-by-the-numbers kind of enterprise. Um, thirdly, um, a consequence is that in any marine area, the train left the station a long time ago. You are not starting from a clean slate. You must understand the existing governance system, formal and informal, if you're going to add another layer, um, maybe even change the direction of the conservation development process. Okay. Um, what then about good practices for MSP generally, but that strengthen cross-border collaboration? Again, these are initial ideas. Um, again, heard yesterday, heard again today, I don't think we would have heard five years ago that trust, since this is a social political process, uh, trust amongst those people, mutual respect and understanding um, are crucial. And there are a number of strategies that can be used and that are illustrated by our four case studies and others to, to consciously go around building trust. The last speakers talked about how a good monitoring and evaluation system can do that, can bring people together and therefore bring trust. Um, declarations of common purpose. I think the very outstanding PEMSI program um, in Southeast Asia um, has done great things with declarations, the Monado Declaration, other declarations, which go forward and say, we the undersigned believe or intend to do A, B, and C. Um, case studies, hopefully our four case studies, can be very revealing. Um, certainly if you go to business school, it's all about case studies. Again, this is a social political process. Case studies that are written from that perspective can do a great deal of good. We also heard in the uh, CTI example and elsewhere such things as, a, as an atlas that puts everybody's information or lack holes in information on the same table is very useful. And again, tying back to trust really, um, the, the value of a strong, capable, non-politicized, coordinating body can do great things. Uh, I say non-politicized because in a number of cases, since those entities have considerable power and influence, they can become politicized and captured by one faction, and then they lose their value. But um, good coordinating bodies, i.e. an engine for collaboration, um, is worth careful design and good funding. So, Understanding the existing governance system, um, obviously one must not look only at the formal system, but the traditional practices, um, local knowledge, uh, where that proves to be reliable knowledge um, is enormously important. Um, we, we need to really look at governance systems as we would, as natural scientists, look at the ecology of governance. Where's the power? What are the food chains? Uh, what are the drivers of, of, of change and adaptation? And, and really understand um, that and not be shy of the word power. Uh, also, not be shy of the word corruption. 
uh, which certainly in my career at the beginning you couldn't talk about corruption. Now fortunately corruption is on the table. Um, and back to the case study idea of looking for barriers and enablers which tend to be very place specific. We've heard many times that the culture of the place um, is, is a major shaper of how things happen. They also tend to define in a shorter time period what's possible and what's not possible. Um, the four case studies, I think, illustrate the, the power of having an issue-driven approach. Um, we, we've, everybody recognizes the importance of, of setting goals, but the goals need to mean something to people. Um, goals need to stir the blood, um, must get people engaged. And if an MSP process is dealing with issues that people really care about, then the possibilities for building support, a constituency, building commitment, mobilizing political will, all those important things are much more likely to happen than if no one's quite sure why all this amassing of information and um, sharing of data, why, what are we doing it for? Um, you, you need an, an issue to, to drive that. Um, pilot projects are very important in setting credibility, but one also sees that scaling up pilot projects is often extremely difficult because you have to go back and build those bases. And the case studies, particularly in the larger areas um, like the CTI, the Carl Triangle, and, and uh, Calomar show that learning by doing um, approach. Um, I think you just heard very good things said about M&E um, and the research that goes hand in hand with M&E um, needs to address uncertainties and unknowns that matter to understanding and dealing with those issues just because it's interesting information. Um, this is very much of a long-term process. And yet, our certainly internationally, our funding windows tend to be much shorter than the time it's going to take to get anywhere near the goals that we aspire to. Particularly, the global goals would take massive changes in the governance of this planet. Um, they're, it's very good and useful to have them, but one needs to break them down into something that's more doable uh, over the short term um, and to be specific as to just what it is one is trying to do and make sure that whatever it is actually does contribute to a move towards greater sustainability. Um, I think that's a weak link that Bud pointed out yesterday. The, the does it really contribute is something that we need to ponder more carefully. And again, I have it under long-term perspective here. I'm not quite sure why I put it there, but um, the four case studies show that MSP, if it is a world view, if it is another way of, 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 of seeing things, um, requires a rather unusual form of leadership. Uh, very often, I think, again, some of the case studies illustrate this, that it's not leadership in one hero, one person, it's really a more diffuse leadership of a group of people with different skills, because this does require many different skills that are seldom all in one person. And so you need to think carefully about and act on defining 
seeking out the kind of leadership that is actually going to take you somewhere. We've also heard a lot about stakeholder involvement. Um, I think it became clear over these sessions that more participation is not better than less participation. Uh, participation must be meaningful, it must have purpose, it must have clear goals, it must be put forward in a transparent manner, and hopefully we are moving away from a period when people just held meetings, uh, held workshops that, that often didn't lead to anything much, and in fact created a sense of frustration that can be very, very frustrating and really erodes trust. So thinking about how m and &E happens is, is, is crucial. Did this just jump around? Um, Long-term monitoring evaluation, I've said some things about that. Okay, so when one thinks about the EU and these case studies and all that goes with them um, being used as a basis for making recommendations to the EU on how best to uh, encourage, sustain, catalyze collaborative learning, um, I would go back to one of the things that shaped this project, which is really spending the time to come up with a common framework for analysis and um, framing of initiatives. Um, that has been resisted in, in ICM. Um, I think it's resisted in um, MSP. Um, and we, we need to get beyond that. There are many guides, many of them excellent, not least the step-by-step -step approach, but as we come to terms with what are we learning, how do we learn better, how do we collaborate with each other more effectively, um, I think we need to go further in figuring out a common way of assessing progress, uh, setting um, standardized measures that we can all follow and agree to. Um, I think that the EU, and as it works with partners outside the EU, even in the EU, um, underscoring again the understanding the existing socio-political context is, is utterly crucial. Um, I personally advocate for what I call governance baselines that basically ask the question, how did we get to where we are now to help us understand how we can move towards the future? Um, finally, investing in, cap in capacity building, if we are correct, that lack of capacity in the practice of the ecosystem approach is our major limitation, then building that capacity in a multitude of ways is going to be crucial. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. And I'm just going to invite Stephen just to join the, the, the chairs here. Um, I can see that uh, we're getting some questions in on Slido, so we're going to endeavour to use Slido now to, uh, to frame some questions here in a question and answer session. Um, I apologise also, also on behalf of us all, that so I understand that at lunch there were some challenges in, in getting fed in time, so we have slightly truncated um, this, uh, this session. So could I ask the, um, the IT suite just to change that to... Uh, 24 minutes, please, just so we've got a timer ticking down, please. So that's just to make sure we're not late for coffee, if indeed we've been late for lunch. Um, what, um, what I want to do also is just, is just as a final comment, just is to say that, as I said at the beginning, say at the middle, say at the end, that there is going to be a final report coming out. And for those that do want to drill down into this, please don't hesitate to um, get in touch. 
and we and the, we're, we're through the EC or through indeed through the project team for how to disseminate that information. Okay, so I have the full list of questions here on my phone, as indeed you can see from, from looking on your tablets or phones. But we can see the top three coming up on the screen. And there's a question asked there that seems to be a number of you. It's, it's, um, it's the person N, so I don't know, that's a, an anonymous person, um, or maybe labeled by a letter. But um, this is a question for the panel here. Um, so can you, can you see the questions as well? Or you can look around? Just barely, I can read it out. It says, uh, first question then, would anyone like to share thoughts on what is the best example of transboundary MSP to the present? Would anyone like to start us off in reflecting on what, in your opinion, is the best example of transboundary MSP? Anyone like to jump in with the case study they represent, or indeed maybe another one? Uh, there are some mics on the stage. I'll just, uh, there are mics, there's two mics just on the table, so if you could pass those along. Would you like to start, Stephen? I can hand you a mic. Well, I would just uh, <laughs> play the game of rephrasing the question, and I think it really depends upon the context. Um, I think that what may be a magnificent success in one setting another setting would say, what's the big deal? We did that five years ago. Um, so it really is context specific, I think. Um, again, if we had a common framework, um, I think that if we could all agree a bit more clearly on um, what are the changes in human behavior that show movement towards the changes in state that we desire um, and judged how good an effort is in how much progress it makes in bridging by changing behavior to those ends, then we'd really be moving along in a uh, more efficient manner. You want to Thank you, Stephen. Would anyone else like to comment on the, such a sort of fundamental question? I guess the, the phrase in the question with the word best is inconsistent with our thinking of good versus best. Would anyone like to add to that, or so we can move to the next question? Oh, Dominique, oh, yes, I, please. I just wanted to rein, reinforce that. I think there's no such thing as the best uh, example. There's only the examples in a particular set of circumstances that actually work for the group of people, countries, etc., that are concerned. That's really it. And uh, this issue, I mean, the case study shows that there's a, a, a high diversity of approach, so we should build on the diversity rather than try to have something that's more uniform. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Okay, well, we're going to move to the next question, and this is from Yolanda Schmal, which has 21 likes. And the question here is, what's the biggest challenge in cross-border cooperation? So the other side of the coin. Would anyone like to comment on what you believe on from the things that we've been sharing, if you had to distill down to the biggest challenge? Gonzalo. Hey, I'll just make a, a quick attempt. And I would say it's, it's, it's sort of fostering this uh, or, or, or getting to a common understanding, a sort of a, a common purpose of what we're doing. I mean, it being, and that's not any different from any other political process. It's getting everyone on board and moving in the same direction. That's where we've seen, even the, in the very successful cases we've have explored here, where the, sort of the difficulties remain at the fringes of these people or, or institutions who do not want to be involved. And then how, how you get them on board, how you get them involved, how you get them to contribute and to commit, that's the, uh, I mean, if, if someone can get a formula to do that, then, the, then you'll answer the first question also. Thank you very much, Gonzalo. I can see Jen's just reached to the mic, and Hanno, did you want to comment afterwards? So, Jen, did you want to respond? So, um, it's on. Okay. Um, so, when Gonzalo came to visit us in Rhode Island, he kept asking us, well, how come you're not working with Massachusetts? They have an ocean plan, too. How come you didn't share information with them? And, and the, the truth of the matter is, is we were competing with them. We, we wanted to be the first developer of offshore wind turbines in the Northeast, and so did they. And so although we were all very friendly and we're, we're good buddies now, because um, we're the first, we won, um, 
but the point is, is, is we, they wanted all of our information, yet our state was paying to collect all that data. And they, their state had some funding, but not to the degree that we did at that point. So that was a challenge. We were competing with each other um, for business and jobs. Thank you, Jen. Hannah, did you want to go? I just wanted to make the point that actually, when we look at uh, MSP processes that are within single jurisdictions, it's very much easier to control uh, what activities are managed and how they're managed and how they're planned and who's involved and how decisions are made. The challenge, I think, for cross-border and cross-jurisdictional MSP is that there are a group of entities who don't have complete control over all of those things. And therefore, there is always going to have to be an exchange, cooperation, collaboration with the different jurisdictional systems. So you might, for example, in the CTI, find that you've got six countries coming together and they can work out their goals. But then how does that relate to the, the regional fisheries management organization that's also in the region that's managing fisheries? So they are going to have to collaborate with the existing governance systems that are there. So I think cross-border, cross-jurisdictional MSP really struggles it's across the jurisdictions. And I, I don't want to put you on the spot, Mark, but I wonder whether from the CAMLAR perspective, you want to talk about the, the, the EEZs within the CAMLAR um, area and how maybe that, that's a similar idea behind that. Yeah, I think perhaps... Um dwell a bit perhaps on the process that went into the designation of the Ross CMPA this year that took the best part of a decade to, to reach the conservation measure 91 whatever it is um, and I think the, the difficulty there uh, again through an organization that works by consensus is that the outcome at the end looked very different to different people to what their expectation was at the outset and there has to be I think you have to go into that with an understanding that um, the outcome, just actually getting agreement between 25 different members with very different uh, drivers, um, what, what they wanted, some fishing interests, some purely environmental interests, some sort of historical legacy sovereignty type interests. Um, there. Um, so these things do take a lot of time, but I think the, the outcome in the end was never going to be perfect for everybody. But I, I think the real achievement there was just actually getting some agreement by consensus, given that diversity of views at the outset. So I think these things can be achieved over time uh, if you go into it with a very open mind and your expectations perhaps are not too high across all the different sectors. Thank you very much, Mark. Any other comments on this or we move to the next question? Okay, um, next question I'm going to share is, um, is one that's coming up for an anonymous question here, which is around tools. And the question is, what decision support tools foster transboundary collaboration in MSP, in your view? Would anyone like to comment on that question? There's a look of a, a blank look there. Is that there's no tools, or you feel that there's, there's none that foster it, or maybe it's the definition of this word tool? We can move on if you're feeling that uh, we can move. Um, now, I'm actually just going to actually move to the third question there. Is there, I don't know, from the IT, are you able to swipe questions off the top? The second question on specifically um, Baltic experience applied to the MED, I'm just going to hold for the moment just because of the constituency of the panel here. I think there may be, unless someone wanted to comment on that, I feel that that may be beyond the specific expertise here. But the question here is, um, could the approach undertaken by CAMLA be mirrored in the Arctic? as we continue to experience further thaw and increase usability of the area. And I'm reflecting also on, on Bud's comments in the, in the, um, in the our, um, keynote opening address about uh, the Arctic. So I'm afraid that's uh, potentially back to you, Mark, but it's uh, interesting from a high seas point of it, view. It is an interesting question and uh, one that's discussed quite a lot. And I think I personally would be very disappointed if the agreement that was reached in the Arctic was merely an RFMO without any broader environmental remit or ecosystem approach um, actually uh, in the documentation that, that establishes that, that body. Um, CAMLAR, as I've said today, has been in operation for, for 35 years. We, uh, 
we're not always perfect and there are still difficulties and still huge gaps in, in the data and knowledge. Um, but I don't think anyone is, would ever consider that it has been a, a bad road to go down to consider the ecosystem approach at the outset. And having it enshrined in the convention from the outset um, made it much easier for everything that came afterwards. So I think it would be a, a regressive step to make it look like just an RFMO at this point. Although that said, obviously the challenges and the locality of EZs close by in the Arctic and the fact that it's almost the, excuse the pun, the sort of polar opposite to what we have in the Antarctic with an open ocean surrounded by continents as opposed to a continent surrounded by open ocean. Um, but I think there are an awful lot of parallels that can be drawn between the two. Thank you, Mark. Is there any other further reflection from, I know Mark's from within, looking at maybe from within the Antarctic or Kamala perspective? Anybody else wants to comment on? Oh, yes, Dominique, please. Uh, just, I'm not an expert in either, but it seems to me that the two situations are very different. Uh, you have a, a different type of sovereignty regime, if I could say, in both uh, region. Uh, one, there's no people living there. The other, there is. Uh, the Antarctic um, area has got a, a treaty system in place. I don't know that there's such a strong legal basis in the Antarctic. So I think there's quite, there are quite different areas and they require probably different, situa different solutions. Having said that, there's a lot to be learned from uh, the Antarctic situation. Thank you, Dominique. I'm going to move on to another question. Um, I can see that there's some, uh, a late flurry here. I can see, Jen, you're, you're on the spot at the top here. Would you care to comment um, on the question, that, is it necessary to establish special planning regulations for fisheries? And uh, how can fisheries be integrated into MSP? And I believe that maybe not specifically, you, you've, you're, you've been named maybe to start okay. you off, but others well, may also you, have Anonymous. a view. I appreciate that. Um, so I, I would say that, um, you know, as, as Stephen said, um, marine spatial planning is social and political. And at least in the United States, you know, we have a very complex fisheries management initiative. And um, it was very clear whenever we're doing any sort of management, that's, that's not going away. And there's a huge stakeholder initiative and a regulatory process with research and whatnot that, that is established there. Our ocean SAMP effort was, was very connected. We were very much um, aware of what was going on there um, unofficially. Um, and, and as I mentioned, the fishermen for us they were one of our major stakeholders. We almost had a whole separate stakeholder process specifically for them. Um, we brought Europeans, um, um, people who were, who were experts in understanding the effects of, of electromagnetic fields and wind turbines on fish. We have a, an established fisherman's advisory board, the example that I gave you, and they are so appreciative of being part of the Ocean Samp, that Fisherman's Advisory Board is allowing them to have a seat at the table for monitoring and evaluation um, within the Samp area as far as, as well as future development. As I mentioned, next week we have a FAB meeting and we're gonna be talking about sand and gravel mining. So they're really front and center, center part of our Marine Spatial Planning Initiative. In the beginning, you know, they looked at me like I was the devil. And when we started updating the SAMP, they were, they were like, how can we help you? We'd love to help you because they see the value of the marine spatial planning process. So they are a huge stakeholder. They need to be a part of the process. Um, but as far as that fisheries management, at least for us, there's, there's some, you know, there's other fish to fry, so to speak, and there's more. It's not, it's, it's not low hanging fruit, it's not, it's way high. It's, it's too much, I think, to um, assume you can do all of that. Thank you, Jen. Um, Gonzalo, would you like to respond? Can I just, yeah. If I may just add, add to the second half of the question, because fisheries, I mean, although the fisheries management was not changed, the, the, the regulations and the policies in the Ocean SAM do contain measures uh, relating to how new activities uh, uh, affect or engage with fisheries. Um, and, and actually, and how fisheries, for example, fishing vessels should behave in the vicinity of certain developments. So in that respect, it, 
So it's sort of an, an, an aspect of how fisheries can be integrated in, in a plan through in its, uh, in its implementation measures. Thank you, Arash Gonzalo. I'm briefly going to cover one more question and then I'm going to just invite a last comment from each of the, uh, the panel. But the, the question at the top here I can see is uh, from Federico Fabri. And this last question that I'm going to ask now from the Slido is, can dynamic ocean management strategies be integrated in MSP? Would anyone from the panel care to comment or reflect on that question? Steve. Okay, um, Steve, would you like to comment on it, or would you like to invite the question to, questioner to uh, want to comment on dynamic ocean management? Yeah, sure, yeah, okay. So if we're interpreting dynamic ocean management as uh, using real-time data to support real-time changes in policies or, or planning decisions, uh, then, then absolutely dynamic ocean management is something that can be integrated into marine spatial planning, in my view at least. Um, the downside, I think, is that it kind of implies that marine spatial planning is something of a technical process and not the sort of political, participatory, social process as we've described it here. So I think if uh, dynamic ocean management were to be integrated into marine spatial planning, it would need a, a large amount of pre-thinking with significant stakeholder and uh, relevant industry involvement to really understand well, you know, in what scenario would it be reasonable to change a policy response given a real-time data change threshold in any, certain, in any sort of particular uh, situation. So I do wonder uh, if it requires a, a sort of fairly hardcore application of some social science techniques to understand well, what are the value sets that are underpinning stakeholder interests in a marine area and how can those value sets best be served in a changing dynamic circumstance and how can the policy responses respond to those value sets uh, instantly uh, upon the change of a, a real-time threshold. Thank you very much. Was there, I can see someone being prompted, is it? Okay, I'm not sure, is there, a, did you want to comment? What? Please do. I mean, we've uh, got a concept called feedback management uh, within the CAMLA uh, approach to krill fisheries management, particularly in the Antarctic Peninsula region, which if my understanding of dynamic ocean management is the same as just heard from Steve, that uh, yes, I mean, Kamala, I've looked at this for a number of years. Uh, we, progress again is, is very, very slow, and, uh, but really it is just a, a tool. So I think you would use whichever tools are, are best suited to the, to the job. And I think in that I'd use you know, temporal seasonal closures as well as almost a real time feedback on, on krill density, uh, predator location to inform how a fishery might be managed within a particular season uh, that can differ quite substantially from year to year. So actually having um, single conservation measures in place that, that don't get modified in a dynamic fashion from year to year perhaps isn't the most appropriate uh, situation. So I, I definitely think there is a place for them if that's the correct <laughs> reading of interpretation. Thank you very much, Mark. Now with time pressing on, I'm just going to now, I can see Steve's got the mic, just going to run through the, um, the, uh, the team here and I can say very publicly thank you very much this very interesting year we've all had thinking about different case studies. Could I invite you now one by one if there's one bit of advice from looking at from, from engaging in this study for the last year uh, regarding that you might want to share with the group here on uh, cross-border uh, MSP what would that be and please just pass the mic down and if anything you might wish to comment starting with Steve at the end. Thanks. Um, my advice would be to understand and make the most of social science to really understand people's motivations for cooperation. Genoa, okay, would you like to comment? Uh, one bit of advice from, from uh, looking at cross-border MSP from, um, from the, either from a um, Jarmen perspective or more broadly from this study? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, I, I think that uh, I, I would just say uh, there are many challenges of uh, MSP to initiate M MSP or to address the cross-border issues uh, by MSP. 
And uh, one of the one, one thing that I would like to 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 what will remind me the last question is about the previous question about the dynamic. I think that uh, uh, Stephen mentioned that the the MSP is the polit social political process, and it, it should be be adaptive. It should be part of the adaptive management of the uh, marine management. So it's it's not uh, just uh, you know we 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 have a, a marine function zoning a practice in China. We we have one plan and uh, we 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 can we can have that plan uh, for all the time. We have to revise regularly or. Uh, uh, in terms of the, the the change of the conditions, so I think uh, we have to 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 adapt to the change, and also we learn from the doing. I think that's uh, important for not uh, um, only the cross border issues, but also for the whole uh, process of the marine spatial planning. Thank you, Kirwa. Thank you. I think I would just like to stress a point that, that Stephen made, that the, the importance of MSP being issue-driven. And I think in, in cross-border contexts where cooperation or in, so engaging authorities and individuals across border is so much more difficult, uh, not having an issue to sort of to, to, to congregate efforts around uh, um, will make it even more difficult. I mean, it will take out the justification for, for actually that extra effort. Thank you, Gonzalo. No? Um, yeah, the point that I would make is just around political will and the really critical importance of political will. And, you know, we sort of live in times where um, sustainable resource management is becoming increasingly politicised. And so I just think it's going to become increasingly important to be able to speak to a whole range of different political actors about the benefits of these sorts of interventions um, in a way that's kind of sustainable and acceptable to people on all sides of the um, political spectrum. Thanks. I think my comment would be that um, cross-border MSP is an inev inevitability. I think because we are looking at the issues and it will be issue-driven, not least if we are to comprehensively deliver an ecosystem approach, I think cross-border MSP is an inevitability. So my, my point would be really that we need to look at the regional scale institutions and instruments and bodies that are in existence and see if they have the capacity currently to deliver the kinds of cross-jurisdictional, cross-sectoral management that we really need for that kind of scale in ecosystem-based management. And how can we strengthen those linkages? I think understanding that there's a need to remain flexible against uh, a backdrop of a changing environment and, and changing needs and sectors and players. I would say set realistic expectations. Um, you know, we keep talking about the, this policy cycle. The first time you do it, set realistic expectations. Maybe it's not regulatory first. Maybe it's um, tangible success stories. The next time it's a little bit more difficult, so set realistic expectations. Um, I think for me it's uh, one thing that came really strongly is one, si one size does not fit all. This is one really important lesson. And the other one, which actually uh, is something that you just said before, is that uh, we talk about collaboration as if it was a, a done deal and it doesn't necessarily uh, mean that it is, and uh, competition might be just as a strong driver for um, looking at um, how you look at ocean news. You have to sort of be open to different drivers to um, solutions, I think, and we're not necessarily uh, going to see uh, collaboration as being the thing that will work. It might be that there's other things to think about. Well, a whole lot of good ideas, but uh, I guess what I would say is that um, we collectively, over the last few decades, in various forms of 
integrating approaches to managing spaces. Um, we haven't been very efficient learners, I don't think. The learning process has been slow and painful, lots of reinventing of the wheel. And I think as we go forward, we really need to focus on how can we learn together more efficiently, more effectively. Um, the idea of accepted frameworks for assessing ourselves as we go forward is, is, is part of that. But um, I would plea for more effort in being collaborative learners. Thank you very much, Stephen. I can just a final reflection from uh, managing this project. I can see the word cloud behind our speaker's head says complexity is the biggest word. Um, the word that has come out that I sort of percolate through from this study and indeed for the last two days is around trust. Is that without trust, anything, whether it's collaboration, all other processes are challenging. And that's, if that was one word, I would think that uh, springs to mind. But um, thank you very much for your indulgence over the last four hours, notwithstanding the lunch break listening to reflections we've had on this study. And um, I now just have one last chance to thank, uh, I think, Big Ham for the, uh, the speakers that have shared their thoughts.